Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining from around the world for this very timely conversation about the power of youth for agricultural transformation with the views from Sub-Saharan Africa. We have approximately 650 colleagues who are joining us virtually from all around the world. And while we, could, we wish we could meet in person, the silver lining in all of this is that these virtual events allow us to engage with so many more leaders fighting the good fight at global, regional, national, and local letters, levels. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nabiha Kazi Hutchins, and I'm the founder of the international development agency Humanitas Global, which works on the front lines with partner institutions to build community resilience, improve youth development outcomes, and end hunger and malnutrition in our lifetime. Humanitas is proud to serve as the Secretariat for the Movement to Advance School-Based Agricultural Education, and I am honored to facilitate this discussion. I'd like to thank the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the Alliance to End Hunger for co-hosting this event. A few quick housekeeping notes and we will get to it then. Uh, the first is that today's webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with all participants after the event. The event is also being live streamed on Twitter via the handle at FAO North America. You can also add your questions for panelists via the Q&A box. Uh, and what we ask is if you will please address your questions to specific panelists and include your organizational affiliation and country from where you are joining us. You can also add comments or share any reports on the subject being discussed via the chat box during the webinar. And please tweet about the event. Due to uh, the time limitation, the longer bios of the participants will be shared via the chat box um, as, uh, as will be mentioned and you'll see that pop up as, as we speak. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Vilmandra Sharan, who's the director of the FAO North America office. Director Sharan and the entire FAO North America team have been incredible partners with so many organizations. And I personally want to extend my gratitude to Director Sharan and his team for bringing forward important topics, relevant voices that enable informed and collaborative action to feed and nourish our world. Director Sharan, I'll hand it over to you to make your opening remarks. Thank you, Nabiha, uh, and a very warm welcome to all the participants uh, joining us from various parts of the globe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you're from, and to all the panelists also who are with us from various uh, corners of the globe, Asia, Africa, and everywhere. Uh, very warm welcome to Her Excellency, Dr. Banda, former president of the Republic of Malawi, for gracing this occasion, taking time out, and agreeing to share her uh, views, thoughts, and ideas on how to take this important issue of youth in agriculture and the power of youth in bringing about innovation and agricultural transformation forward. Thank you, Dr. Banda, for uh, joining us. We all know the importance of this topic, especially due to the changing demography. Today in the world, as per the 2019 data, uh, between the ages 15 and 35, we have nearly uh, 2.4 billion young uh, men and women accounting for 31% uh, of the global population. And that's a huge number and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is no exception with nearly 76% of the region's population below 35 years of age, yeah, amounting to nearly 380 million young, young boys and girls or young men and women. Uh, this is a huge number and it can be uh, looked and seen as a burden, or it can be seen as a potential and a demographic dividend. And I, I really, at FAO, we, we wish to see it as an enormous potential to be harnessed and a demographic dividend to be drawn upon. Uh, what is most important, of course, is that we need to promote better jobs for youth, and that is an urgent priority. And this priority has been confirmed by having specific targets for youth in, in the Sustainable Development Goals. It has been confirmed by Africa's government in the 2014 Malabo Declaration in the uh, Africa Development Bank Strategy Jobs for Youth in Africa. So it, there is an agreement that we need to employ youth 
gainfully. And what better way to do it than through sustainable uh, development of sustainable agriculture and food value chains, which can and which has the potential of absorbing and giving remunerative jobs to, to youth. Uh, while agriculture has the potential, the youth also have the potential, the energy, the enthusiasm to really innovate, to absorb innovation and to change and transform agriculture. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an integrated, it's a two-way process to will a transformed agriculture uh, attract youth or will the youth transform agriculture? So this question uh, needs to be answered. And I think in my mind, the answer is very clear. It has to be both. So we need to work both from the pull and the push factors to ensure that youth in Africa really take to agriculture. And I'm sure to speak to these issues, these questions and such like, we have a fantastic panel with us. We have a absolutely uh, outstanding keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Banda, to give her views. And I, for one, am really looking forward to listening to all of them and learning from them understanding the issues that face the sub-Saharan African youth and how, and the path forward in, in taking them out of drudgery, poverty, and uh, uh, food insecurity and malnutrition. So with that, um, let me hand it back to Nabiha uh, to take the proceedings forward. Nabiha. Thank you very much, Director Sharan. Um, Africa has prioritized agricultural and rural transformation as central to achieving equitable progress at scale. And the timeliness of our discussion today is rooted in many of the factors that Director Sharan has shared with us. Today, we are in need of deeper global and multi-sectoral collaboration that works for agriculture and youth. As Director Sharan has said, both. Uh, reshaping our food system and the agricultural landscape requires a youth-centric lens and agriculture enables the right of young people to achieve their full potential and youth will drive and sustain the change that Africa sees it's for itself. The power of youth-led agricultural transformation is formidable because with, without it, we are going to fall short in our goals to save lives, to end poverty, end hunger, revolutionize learning, and so much more. We promised we would achieve all of this in our lifetime, and this is a promise that we must keep. There can be no better and more steadfast advocate for youth, agricultural development, and rural transformation than Her Excellency, the former president of the Republic of Malawi, Dr. Joyce Banda. You can see her bio in the chat, but among her tremendous achievements and impact, President Banda has not only been intentional in putting youth at the center of her policy agenda as president, but has also been undeterred throughout her distinguished career in building pathways for youth to learn, thrive, achieve, and prosper throughout their lives. We are honored to have you here, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Nabiha, for that uh, introduction. Um, it's a privilege and honor for me to be among such a distinguished panel. I thought maybe I should start by saying Every time I see Nabiha, I see her on a farm. Well, that's how she grew up. Um, and uh, again, to say that in the year 2000, I turned 50 years old. And I became very clear in my mind at that time that it was time for me to be begin to step aside to ensure that the next generation takes the lead. I, uh, I then uh, formed what I called the Young Women Leaders Network in Malawi. Um, believing that in this intergenerational process, this crusade to empower young people in Africa, it will be nothing about young people without the young people taking the lead. So as I participate in this discussion this afternoon, I'm very much aware that I'm 70 years old, but I also believe that it is healthy for Africa, for us to, 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 to work together with young people to create space it's a moral obligation for me to make sure that the challenges we faced of having no role models, no voices for us must not happen to the next generation. We must fight for them. And it is my duty to do that until the job is done. I'm thrilled that Humanitas Global is serving as the secretariat for the school-based agricultural education 
And I'm proud to lend my voice to this important work that supports Africa, Africa's development goals. I'm very grateful to the FAO, the Alliance to End Hunger, and Humanitas Global for inviting me to be part of this discussion today. I also want to thank the esteemed panelists. Thank them sincerely for the perspectives they will bring. And to all attending for your time and commitment to this issue. I wish everyone good health and continued resilience in this time of COVID-19 uncertainty. May we build back together uh, and better. The topic of the role of youth in transforming agriculture is very important. Having youth at the table to shape and drive change today and into the future is not only something that is simply good to have, but rather is something that we must have, whether we like it or not. As I was reflecting upon this panel and what I would say for the renewed actions and commitments, I was inspired with the realization that each of you, those of you attending and the guests who are speaking are already doing so much to bring youth forward and elevate and support them to the greatest heights. But let us recognize something. We need young people. In fact, we may need them more than they need us. It is youth who have the bold ideas. They are the effectors of change. They are who hold us accountable and ask the purest of questions to ensure justice, health, and opportunity for all. And as I talk and refer our youth in this manner, I also must inform all that um, the youth have just changed the destiny of our country. We, we have just made history. We have removed the president who was there for a year and they have sought justice, they have raised their voices. I have so much confidence and hope and belief in the youth of Africa that the energy they demonstrate in every sector will take us forward and prosper as a continent. We need youth in order to achieve the ambitious goals of our future. We must harness the power and talent of young people from the earliest of ages in the name of humanity, prosperity and equity. Our time to do this is now. Our world is, as is my beloved Africa, is young. Four in 10 people or 42% of the global population are under the age of 25. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to almost 1 billion people and more than 60% of Africans are under the age of 25. By 2050, it is estimated that the population of the region will likely double and half will be under the age of 18. This poses both a challenge and an opportunity. The outcome of this boom in population and the role of youth depends upon how wise we are in this moment. There's no doubt that with population growth, there will be greater strain on natural resources. The agricultural landscape and our food system. But let us remember that Africa's youth possesses something that is undeniable. The drive to achieve, innovate, and improve the outcomes of their lives and of their communities. I have spent my entire life working with youth. I have invested in youth, given authentic credence to their voice and many policy decisions informed by the answer to the question, is it good for young people? And I've only come to the answers to this question by listening to the young people themselves. And that is what I hope we will do. Because Africa has a big, bold agenda. It has put education, agriculture, and innovation as the drivers of these development goals. I'm referring to the African Union Agenda 2063. In the driver's seat are young Africans, and we must prepare them. 
If we ensure education is accessible and inspiring, and that the teachers are supported with training and deliverable uh, wages, we can transform learning outcomes. If we embed agriculture into pathways that reach youth from the early years through schools and vocational programs, students become agricultural change agents. If we are intentional about putting innovations in the hands of youth so they can taste, experience, and see the results of these innovations, youth not only become the adopters, but are the ones who influence those in their community circles. For Africa to harvest the benefits that the agriculture and youth makes us can offer, there is an urgent need to change the mindset of what agriculture is. When youth have the opportunity to go to school, they do not see agriculture as a career. Why? Because all around them, they see farmers, especially women doing backbreaking work in the field. They see poverty associated with the agriculture and peasant farming. They see agriculture as the last resort option. In the past 10 years, I've sponsored about 1,500 students uh, going to university, most of them to the University of Agriculture in, here in Malawi, to the College of Agriculture here in Malawi. And it has been extremely difficult to persuade them to create their own jobs after graduating. In fact, they will go change and go into teaching and other professions because of these same reasons. We therefore need to change mindset. We need youth to see agriculture as a viable and profitable business opportunity. One that builds up communities is valued across the continent and creates jobs. There's so much potential to build up agriculture, but we have to start from the early years and shift the paradigm. We have a massive responsibility to encourage young people to take an own agriculture serious careers how do we do that? One, governments must have the political will to embed agriculture advances in the hands of today's farmers and our future farmers through community school and other spaces. And we must do so in ways that are also responsive to needs of women and girls. Two, when I talk about women in agriculture, women and girls in agriculture, I I ask the question, particularly as an African woman leader, why is it that an African woman will till the land, plant, tend the crop, harvest, store, process, cook, and then eat last and least? These are some of the things that we must discuss. And it is only young people who will change that mindset. Two, Donors investing in innovations, technology, and better quality inputs also have the responsibility to invest in building youth-centered pathways for uptake. For example, we need to mainstream the mechanization of agriculture, scale access to better seeds, and improve post-harvest practices. To do that, we need young people to experience and see the impact firsthand. Number three, Three, the youth need to be trained as business leaders. While being exposed to the power of agriculture, there are important leadership, professional, and life skills that agricultural training and education can offer. But this training and education must be rooted in a business-oriented model. And four, we must lift up the youth voice and grant them the platform they deserve the global, regional, national, and local levels. We must embrace their power because youth have the answers. And as I've said earlier, from now onwards, there'll be nothing about them without them. We have a responsibility to reach youth directly where they live and learn so that agriculture is transformed from something that is viewed as the work of the poor to something that is the pathway toward prosperity. 
there is one thing I know. It is that when our investments, policies, and programs reflect a sort of a set of values that are youth-faced, the results are certain. When young people are part of the solution, they are an unstoppable force for justice, change, and achievement. I am inspired and encouraged by the work of each of you. Youth are the fuel of agriculture transformation, but agriculture is also the fuel for our future. The young people of Africa have never disappointed uh, me, and uh, we must not disappoint them, disappoint them. I remain steadfast in my commitment to agricultural development and the development of young people and rural communities in Africa and around the world. I stand in solidarity with the talent joining us today to change our outcome for the better. I will work shoulder to shoulder with you, indeed, until the job is done. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, President Banda, powerful and inspiring as always. And you've also set us up to dive in deeper on how we can catalyze the power of youth and the investments and the commitments that you note are required. Uh, so with that, let us move into our panel discussion. Uh, your chat function again will include the speaker bios. Please use that. I already see some great interaction underway. Uh, but use that chat function to share your perspectives and your own experiences, and then the Q&A function to post any questions, which we'll have space for uh, toward the end. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to kick things off um, hearing uh, from Dr. Hamadi Jop. And uh, Dr. Job comes to us from the African Union Development Agency, AUDA NAPAD, uh, which is the implementing agency of the African Union. And um, Hamadi, you have your finger on the pulse of the policy landscape. You're tracking the views of heads of state across the continent, given your role um, at AUDA NAPAD. And uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about the broader policy landscape. Uh, of course, we know that we have a growing youth population across Africa, and agriculture is viewed as central to economic transformation of the continent. But we wonder if the two are meeting successfully. What are those policy efforts? And perhaps you could talk about the level of intentionality that you are seeing to bring both young people and agriculture together as we build a resilient food system. And perhaps you could comment both from a programmatic side, but also from the investment side. Uh, thank you, Nabiha, for uh, giving me the floor and uh, congratulations to uh, Her Excellency uh, President Banda for uh, this powerful uh, speech that really set the scene on uh, on what is happening in the continent vis-a-vis uh, -vis agriculture and the youth. Um, from my end, um, I would like to uh, basically uh, focus on three issues. The first one would be the policy lens uh, of agriculture. What uh, has the head of state committed to uh, and how uh, they have linked the youth uh, uh, involvement in agriculture. Uh, second, I will uh, try to uh, very quickly uh, discuss about the issues uh, relating to factors that are hindering basically youth uh, empowerment within the context of agriculture uh, in Africa. Uh, and then uh, share a few uh, facts uh, because we also have been tracking uh, through what we call our biennial review process, uh, the, the number of youth who have been involved in different value chains in the continent, uh, and just give you a few percentages to see how uh, the continent is doing uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting the youth to be involved in agriculture. 
so from the policy point of view, uh, our guiding framework uh, within Africa is what we call the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, which is also referred to as CADEP. Uh, probably you may have heard about it. Uh, uh, when the uh, FAO uh, head, uh, Mr. Bimlendra uh, spoke earlier, he referred to it as Malabo, uh, which is also another name that we use in the continent to discuss about Malabo. So Malabo has seven commitments uh, uh, in uh, looking at uh, how to achieve sustainable and equitable economic development, job creation, poverty reduction, and income through agriculture. Uh, through the Malabo declaration now, uh, there was, uh, the youth are identified as a centrality uh, in terms of uh, driving the agenda forward. Uh, there are three elements into uh, that policy framework that basically uh, speak to the youth. One, uh, there is a commitment for uh, head of state and member, uh, member state uh, to the African Union to establish and strengthen what they call inclusive private, pu public-private partnership for at least five uh, priority agriculture community value chain. So that's the first policy uh, element where they want to have a strong linkage with smallholder agriculture. The second uh, policy issue is that within that, uh, those value chain, uh, they have put a target uh, by 2023 to have at least 30% of uh, participants in those value chain to be youth. Uh, and then uh, the last one, the policy basically goal also is to support and facilitate what they call preferential entry and participation for women and youth in gainful and attractive agribusiness opportunities. So this is basically what has been agreed uh, from the policy point of view. However, uh, there are a lot of factors that are preventing this from happening. Uh, and those include uh, the issue of access to land, uh, the issue of finance, the issue of resources, uh, the access to regional and profitable market, uh, the issue of productivity, uh, the low productivity of agriculture, and then also some cultural issue uh, linked to the fact that youth are not very attracted to, to that business. So this basically uh, the, the first two points that I wanted to address. The last point now, uh, I wanted to address, uh, I'm sure it will come back into the other, uh, uh, when we discuss. Uh, through the Malabo, there is a commitment where head of state have agreed to be monitored. Uh, meaning that we track the commitment made by the head of state. So if the head of state have said that uh, by 2025, we need to have at least 30% of, uh, of, um, uh, of youth involved in a strategic value chain, uh, the African Union have put in place uh, a process that we call the biennial review, where we have developed a set of indicators. Uh, we track those indicators and we report before the head of state summit every two years. So during our last uh, biennial review uh, report that was uh, presented before the head of state uh, during the January, uh, February summit uh, uh, of 2019, uh, about 14 uh, countries uh, have reported on, uh, um, on, 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 the, on on the tracking of those numbers. For example, i uh, just give you a few numbers, like for example, in Benin, uh, at the moment they have 19.9% of, uh, of the youth in the, who are involved in strategic value chain. In Burundi, you have 18%. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Banda has left, but I would have told her that uh, Malawi, uh, is one of the country where they have they uh, they have a high rate. Uh, they have about thirty seven percent youth involved on some uh, strategic value chain. So these are the few elements I uh, wanted to share. I don't want to take too much of the time because I'm sure we'll come back to it uh, in uh, uh, in discussing further. Over to you. Wonderful, and thank you for for that backdrop. I think it's very important, and you've reinforced that there is the policy. Uh, commitment. There's more than just words. It's actually written. There's traction and action. Um, mm -hmm. And you've also noted this investment in agricultural innovation. We've seen this across the board, across the continent. And we heard Dr. We heard President Banda talk about how innovations are not getting to the field. So despite the policy backdrop, despite the investments, 
uh, the focus on innovation in the region, these innovations, best practices, efforts to transform the agricultural landscape are not getting into the hands of those um, who can be catalytic, in particular young people. So if you could quickly comment, um, Hamadi, what needs to be different now at the moment of time that we're in? Uh, I think what needs to be different uh, at the moment now uh, is that in the 80s, uh, we had a major drop in the 80s, 90s, uh, of what we call the extension services. Uh, and those extension services were playing a key role uh, in terms of providing uh, a certain type of, of skill development for youth uh, and, and various basically people who were in the rural setting uh, to, 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 to not only be active into, into the agriculture sector, but also to be uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, this has somehow uh, fell through the cracks uh, over time. Uh, the ATV trainings are sometimes fragmented. Uh, so basically the, the, the skill development uh, and agriculture training uh, is not very well coordinated in the continent. And uh, many countries are, are no longer prioritizing the issue of extension. And this has to be brought back because it was playing a key role in the 70s and early 80s. But since the 80s and mid, uh, up to mid 90s has dropped. Uh, so is that something that needs to be done? The second thing also I think that needs to be done is the youth entrepreneurship, uh, the coaching entrepreneurship, and uh, which is one of the points that uh, Dr. Banda touched on when she was, uh, uh, she was basically doing her presentation. Uh, so targeted capacity building should be, uh, should be done uh, to help youth uh, to acquire those skills, uh, to have such uh, self-confidence, uh, but also to help them also to access to market. So it's not just getting to production, but also you need to be able to sell. So all, all the issue of entrepreneurship, agribusiness development, uh, connecting to market, uh, access to resources, access to land has to be sorted out. So the issue of input access uh, is, is, is a challenge in the, in, in the continent. Um, the last uh, issue also, uh, we have a lot of models that have been tested. Uh, for example, at the moment, uh, to the African Union Development Agency, we have a couple of projects uh, that we, where we are working uh, with youth uh, in, 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 in few countries where we come we, we do a skill mapping, uh, we identify where, uh, where capacity is needed, we develop specific curricula, we put them through a rigorous pro uh, training through uh, the ATVET process, and then at the end, uh, we help them to develop like, let's say, business cases. But the challenge usually is like once the youth develop the business cases, uh, there were like a missing link uh, with access to finance. So now we, we're trying to address that issue when we uh, link this to uh, the, the, the youth to basically what we call a uh, rural financier uh, and then help them to, to be entrepreneur. Uh, it's a long road, but uh, uh, we have graduated more than 2,000 students already uh, over the last three, four years. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and and uh, I love hearing how uh, the dot connecting is occurring between policy and and in the field and at the same time, um, what are the opportunities uh, to be even more impactful? And that's something that I want to unpack further with uh, Sherry Atilano, uh, who has joined us from the Philippines. You were appointed by the UN Secretary General as one of the 27 ambassadors for the UN Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Um, you are an agricultural leader in your own right uh, in the Philippines as CEO of Agrea. Uh, and I understand you were working in agriculture from the age of 12 um, and loved it, uh, did it out of love. Uh, so I'd love to hear your perspective. Of course, you're bringing in the nutrition and agriculture perspective to the table with your role um, with Sun, but you're also a voice for the global youth perspective. So Sherry, talk a little bit about the dynamics at play uh, that impact how effectively youth are embedded into agriculture and our broader global discussions around food systems. Thank you very much. Uh, Nabiha for actually inviting me here. Uh, 
Good evening, good day, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's late evening here in the Philippines. Uh, that's a very beautiful question because, you know, most of the time, I guess first, I think I'm a living example of youth in agriculture, not only in the agriculture sector, uh, but also in agribusiness. That actually what Hamadi was actually was discussing about. Um, as mentioned, Benabia, I started teaching farmers at the age of 12 and, you know, put career into agriculture, became an agricultural scientist and now an agricultural entrepreneur and an advocate in agriculture. I just really want to uh, give clarity most of the time on the youth that uh, agriculture is not only about food production, but it's actually, you know, the mission of agriculture is putting food on every table of every person. So once that mission is not achieved, agriculture is failing in the process. So in that sense of production to putting food on the table, there's actually a lot of opportunities in the youth in that spectrum. Uh, there are on-farm opportunities. A lot of youth can actually go into production. You know, our research and extension, like for example, in a company, um, part of your six months probation period, uh, my company is an average age of 28 years old. Uh, employees. We work with more than 20,000 farmers in the Philippines in my company. And part of the need actually to work in the agriculture sector, especially in Agrea, is to immerse yourself in the farmers because we use a lot of youth to be the extension workers in the work. And second one, um, I see a lot of contribution of the youth in sustainability and sustainable agricultural practices. Why is that so? If you work a lot with the youth now on on-farm, they're more aware about the relationship of agriculture to the environment, the relationship of healthy eating, you know, to agricultural production. And a lot of uh, youth actually see also potential on social entrepreneurship. So we work a lot in the social entrepreneurship spectrum because it cut across not only in the production side, but also on value addition and also livelihood development. And on another one, I guess, on the off-farm, uh, what I see right now, especially this COVID pandemic, my company ran the largest uh, food distribution and online platform in the Philippines. Uh, we help more than 20,000 farmers to have market to the consumers. What I see is the potential of the youth to do, to do you know, ICT, information and communication through digitalizing agriculture and also in the supply chain. So I'm sharing this with you because these are practical experience. I've been experiencing running a company that during this COVID-19 pandemic, if you're 60 years old above, you are not allowed to go out of the street because of our total lockdown in Manila. So what we did, we actually got a lot of young people uh, aged from 21 to 35 years old to run our logistics. So they are the ones running through digital platform, monitoring our logistics from you know thousands of islands in the philippines to be here in metro manila connecting to farmers and how to inform farmers on pricing because during this covid 19 pandemic our, our country actually uh, did the freeze pricing so there's a freezing of price for agricultural commodities so the traders will not pan manipulate the market and we put a lot of youth in monitoring that a, a, a price freezing you know in the market because they run the logistics and more than that um during this uh, pandemic also it's pretty imminent that most of our young people who are actually involved in our operation are very aware on promoting healthy products sourcing local and you know and really focusing on even talking to local government units that the local government units will support the farmers not only giving you know, processed food packs to, especially to the poorest of the poor or at risk communities. But there are youth who are really frontliners and created a movement to encourage our local government units to actually use the produce of the farmers to give food packs to the poorest of the poor or at risk communities. And lastly, um, I will actually uh, add it on the Hamadi, you know, point a while ago because I'm so excited. In the Philippines, I'm the Philippine ambassador for food security. I was appointed. And one of our programs actually that got right now uh, around $1 billion fund as an initial fund is the mentoring and agripreneurship for the youth. That each youth, uh, you know, if they have a business idea, they can actually avail a zero interest loan from the government for five years, uh, amounting from $10,000 
to to actually you know uh, until fifty thousand uh, dollars initial capital but the money will not be given if that youth has no business plan if they cannot get a mentor and if they don't have a market so we work on three m's money mentor and market so that they can avail the support of the government and another one also uh, because you know nabiha a while ago mentioned about my work in malnutrition right um malnutrition i guess is a human rights issue but it's also an economic issue especially right now that we need to build our human capital to be really really, really strong uh, we took the power of a lot of young people to be movement makers on how they can change the game that even you know restaurants would really source local a restaurants would focus on building healthy consum consumerism in the market and a lot of these youth are actually building social media campaigns on how to aggressively promote sustainable agriculture sourcing local supporting our smallholder farmers and at the same time building sustainable you know um system between the producers and the consumers Excellent. It's so exciting to hear uh, of your experiences um, as an, an agricultural business leader in the Philippines um, and also recognizing that you wear this global hat, right, with scaling up nutrition. Um, I was wondering if you can highlight one or two um, points that you've learned that you're seeing uh, with the working communities in the Philippines and how that applies to the broader youth context in Africa and beyond. I, I suspect there's some common, um, some common insights that work across borders. So, you know, put on your UN hat a little bit and, and share with us what are some of those cross-cutting insights you're seeing that we need to be aware of. Oh, that's beautiful. Actually, all my best friends are located in Africa in Angola, in, in, in South Africa, and in Kenya. And I always exchange ideas with my friends because the problems of the youth in Africa actually is somehow similar here in Southeast Asia. You know, we're all third world country with very limited resources, with diversity of culture, but with such wealth of network and wealth of access to information now. And during my time, you know, at Nabiha, I was this 15-year-old girl trying to enter conferences before. I would even, like, I couldn't afford to pay conferences and I just, like, sneak and be a volunteer just to learn everything about agribusiness. And right now, you know, I've been having this opportunity and I, I mentor a lot of groups in Africa. I am mentoring one organization now in Tanzania. And what I learned from my mentorship in Tanzania group um, a lot of young people are actually wanted to create change and impact in their community. I think, you know, um, most of the most beautiful and the common ground is people are not looking anymore on just building a business, but they wanted to have a purpose and a meaning. And it's one common values and mindset across, you know, Africa and Southeast Asia. And number one, uh, second one is the power of collaboration and the power of access to information in a way that with the power of access to information it's so easy to, to to create collaboration like asia and africa and what we actually learned from from uh from uh, from asia is actually also applicable to africa i remember last two months ago i judged a competition in sun a scaling up nutrition uh, network in in a in business network in sun and actually the applicants are from africa and i was like wow a lot of these young people who are actually submitting their business proposals to Sun Business Network are actually a little bit not advanced compared to the Asian, you know, agri, agri sector in terms of youth. So what I could, what I shared with that one is most of the youth in Asia are very, very um, broad in thinking and progressive because, you know, we're separated by seas. You know, we're separated by water. If you go to Philippines, to Vietnam, to Indonesia, you need to fly, you need to cross the seas. But the most beautiful in Africa, you're just a massive piece of land. You know, of course, you need to fly to go to other uh, country in Africa, but it's easier with more concerted effort. And at the same time, uh, there's a lot of potential in Africa. And I want to tell my, the, the African youth to stay in Africa the best one is to know your roots 
know your problem because most of the time we focus on just the problem. But I always tell the youth, but the common denominator is if we see ourselves as solutions. You know, if uh, a lot of youth in Africa can actually figure out an innovation, a movement, or an enterprise they want to create, it would be easier for their government to support it because that's what happened in the Philippines. You know, every year we do a roundtable discussion with the youth who are involved in agriculture, agribusiness, agricultural research, and education with the minister or the Department of Agriculture secretary so that our secretary can actually hear us because it's so nice to be heard. And the secretary's office usually design programs on that youth. That's why now there's so much funding going to the youth in agriculture in the Philippines. And for the UN also, um, you know, my work, I, I work with 61 countries uh, with, the, with the help of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement and I speak on the youth. I always say that we are not only the, the future, we are the now and the present and we need to be involved. Before it says that youth for agriculture, we need to make sure that it's youth in agriculture. We're not only involved, but we're also committed to create change in the agriculture sector as a whole. What wonderful. I, I love this point on seeing ourselves as solutions. I'm, I, I know you're referring to you and your youth peers, but I think that's powerful. And, and uh, Dr. Fatia Nabe, you're on the front lines of, of solution finding, right? Um, I, I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, we are thrilled uh, by your uh, appointment, Madam President of the first uh, female president of Makele University in Ethiopia. Uh, you were the first woman plant breeder and lecturer at Makele University and the first female deputy chancellor of the university. Uh, so you're a trailblazer, we're thrilled to have you. And you've also overcome tremendous challenges. I'm curious if you could talk about the unique considerations for young women and girls in agriculture. There is a de gender dimension here and we have to call it out and I can't think of anyone better than than you to provide that perspective. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here today. And um, uh, yes, I'm just uh, working as interim president, but I used to work also as a vice president for uh, research and community services. So I mean, um, there, there are a lot of burdens especially on the youth and female, uh, because, you know, there is a very uh, high negative perception in Africa about women. They are more loaded on domestic, uh, domestic uh, responsibilities. There is a very high time poverty for the females, and we have a, a high number of dropouts, even young graduates, youth and female group. And this is a, a very hot issue. So as part of my responsibility, of course, in Makala University, we have uh, established uh, uh, entrepreneurship center. We have center of entrepreneurship, uh, career center, and the gender institute. So institutionally, we are committed and we are very ready to work on this line. But practically, you know, I wanted to introduce a model on uh, university without border which means uh, we need to integrate uh, educated women with, uh, with uh, dropouts, young stu uh, students uh, in the rural area, even illiterate women who has uh, a very important uh, skill and knowledge in managing their farms. I'm a national coordinator of uh, post-harvest loss uh, innovation lab, uh, Ethiopian chapter. And uh, we, we realize 88% of the post-harvest management is conducted by women. But the uh, access for uh, capacity building, access for uh, incentives, uh, and uh, including them in uh, new initiatives is almost nil. So we are advocating for women. And uh, agriculture is, you know, uh, already defined as uh, as a risky business for investment, even by institutional finance institutes. So we have so many agendas to advocate and convince. But you know, in, in agriculture, we need uh, labor. Uh, we need educated labor, which means we have so many young 
uh, citizens in Africa already educated. The second point is we need land. Land is also not an issue in Africa, but uh, the financial constraints, I mean the commitment by uh, African governments and even by donors to initiate uh, uh, investment uh, on land because we need to invest on land because uh, we are operating on climate change and mountainous areas, dry land areas never been touched because most of the donors and private companies focus is on high potential areas where we have less problem. But the youth who are really migrating and also becoming a burden, we can change them and transform them uh, as an opportunity because the labor force is very important for agriculture to be profitable. So my role here is, you know, uh, uh, we have really to, to transform and uh, update our curriculum in Africa because they are largely uh, academic. So we need to be also very inclusive for, for women. So I have, uh, I have so many new initiatives in my heart, but I am looking for a partnership. You know, it's not easy um, to implement it alone. So I call upon the collaboration of the governments and also collaboration of international uh, donors. You know, uh, we need to be targeted, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to I build, build a little bit on um, some of the extraordinary work that you highlighted. You're working on the front lines of agricultural innovations and scientific achievements at McKinley, and you're also the country lead for the USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab for post-harvest loss. Um, as you know, I'm the daughter of a wheat scientist from Simit, and it's been ingrained in me that research without a dissemination and an uptake plan does little good for humanity. I'm very curious uh, from, from the various leadership roles that you are playing at a, at, at a renowned academic and research institution, how intentional is, is the broader uh, sector of donors and private sector and even the research community in prioritizing young people as part of the dissemination and uptake strategies for innovation and, and maybe share one or two things that you think need to be done. Um, there are a lot of commitments and initiatives I have observed uh, in uh, so many projects and donors. And this, uh, yeah, the issue of use is like a cosmetics, you know. But um, we, uh, we really need to have uh, uh, a serious engagement and a continuous, a continuous support. I mean, we, can, we, can, we have to be accountable for showing successes in targeting the use group. But you know, the use group are mostly involved in the planning process, maybe the targeting aspect will not be, because the youth group themselves, they are heterogeneous. You know, considering them as uniform group is also uh, an issue in addressing. I mean, there are a lot of stresses, issues, and questions by, by the users, but um, when the donors, private companies, uh, also planning to include uh, the youth group, they need to be representative. That's what I would like to mention. Some of the private companies need also intentional incentives to include youth group, because including them as employment, even if they are not profitable for a short time, is a learning process. And our extension system is also a, a top down. We need to have, uh, uh, in Ethiopia, we have approved uh, uh, an inclusive and pluralistic uh, extension services. There is no extension services for private companies working in agriculture. This has to be really uh, considered. Uh, uh, there is also uh, a lot of commitments by respective uh, governments at the local level that they face um, a, a serious financial uh, constraints. I never seen also national governments in Africa put a very clear and big agenda, the issue of use, I mean, how to address the, um, the, the, the cause of the migration instead of addressing the symptom of migration. So it has to come out as a serious strategic agenda in, uh, at a na in a national level, African level, and also international level. Otherwise, it's uh, a very hot and global burden, and but we are ready to uh, to change it and transform it into opportunity through collaborative efforts and commitments. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, this, this piece on um, including the young people and having them at the table, uh, there is tremendous work underway um, in, in so many places of the world, certainly across Africa and bringing young people in and, and having uh, young people drive that change. And, and I'd like to turn to Trent McKnight. Uh, among your experiences and accomplishments, Trent, you're both the president, former president of the National FFA and also founder of AgriCorps. Um, and you've been working on scaling up school-based agricultural <coughs> education in Liberia and Ghana. Uh, many of our speakers, including uh, President Banda, noted the importance of being able to go to young people where they are, where they live, where they're learning, where they're thriving with their communities. Uh, and I'd like to hone in on Liberia with you where you've been working for five years. Uh, tell us about the school-based uh, pathway to reach youth with agricultural and rural communities in Liberia. Tell us a little bit about what it entails and what makes it viable across other contexts. Yeah, thank you, Nabiha. I, so I, I am a product of school-based agricultural education in the United States. Uh, I'm also a farmer, I'm a cattle rancher, so I continue to, to remain grounded in production agriculture, but all that comes from my school-based agricultural education experiences. Uh, in the United States, those brands are known as the Future Farmers of America or 4-H. And so AgriCorps has taken this 100-year-old SBAE, or School-Based Agricultural Education model, and adapted it uh, within a West African context. Uh, we've been working in Liberia and in Ghana. And SBAE encompasses the theoretical foundations of really four different bodies of knowledge, uh, diffusion of innovations, uh, experiential learning, positive youth development, and behavioral economics. And drawing from these different uh, backgrounds and, 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 and disciplines empowers SBAE to be a very cost-effective uh, change mechanism to really accomplish a, a couple of different objectives. Uh, first is, is youth. It, it contributes to the academic, vocational, and life skills of youth through learning by doing methods. And the second, and, and this has been touched on by several, uh, by, by you and, and several of the different uh, participants, to improve rural livelihoods by transferring skills and agricultural innovations into the home and community through schools. So SBA is not just about youth as beneficiaries to become future farmers for future impact. Rather, SBA is about youth as change agents for impact today. And the model, the way that works, uh, so in, in, four, or in, in Liberia, we're working with 4-H Liberia, and Ghana, we're working with 4-H Ghana. Uh, and SBA is a, is a, is a four-component model. Uh, first is classroom instruction. So this is just your traditional chalk and talk in the classroom where the students learn uh, the local agriculture or science curriculum. And we're focused mainly on junior high schools. So that's kind of the, the uh, middle school. So students between 12 and 15 years of age. Uh, so classroom instruction. The second is school demonstration farm, uh, where the students have, have the opportunity to apply what they've learned in the classroom, but also so that parents and farmers within the community can see these different I, I, uh, theories and applications in, 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 in place. The third is home entrepreneurship projects. So uh, several of the, of the panelists have talked about the importance of, of youth entrepreneurship. And the home entrepreneurship project is learning and earning. So it's students applying what they've learned uh, in the classroom, on the school demonstration farm, in their home uh, in a home setting, in a backyard garden, uh, at their home farm, so that they can make money and also uh, apply what they've, what they've learned. And the fourth component is leadership development. Uh, life skills, public speaking, learning how to run a meeting, teamwork and cooperation, these soft skills that uh, are, are, are necessary for employment, whether, whether they are working for others or as entrepreneurial farmers. And this all happens under uh, the organizational structure of a 4-H Liberia or a 4-H or, or a Ghana. Uh, and, then the and then the outcomes really impacting uh, both youth as well as the community uh, and, and seeing, as I've talked to young people, uh, teachers and farmers in these communities uh, that have benefited from school-based agricultural education, seeing, talking to farmers who have improved their yields by 50 to 150% based on what they have learned from a 12-year-old. 
Thank you, Trent. You know, I, 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 I so appreciate and I think those joining, um, hearing about some of the tools that exist to reach youth where they are. Um, and school-based ag education is something that has been tried and true in a range of contexts. Uh, and it's exciting to see how this could work in a range of contexts within the African context. It aligns so beautifully with some of the policy priorities and the needs and uh, quite frankly, this pathway to how we scale up innovation and insights and research. Um, I'd love if you could spend a, a few minutes talking about the longer term results that you're hoping to see from the work uh, in Liberia and down the road in Ghana as well. Yeah, so we are currently conducting a randomized controlled trial in Liberia. We're partnering with economist Chris Udry from uh, Northwestern University's Global Poverty Research, Research Lab to measure the impact of school-based agricultural education, both on youth, but also on adoption rates of farmers of improved agricultural technologies. And this research kind of came out of uh, some anecdotal research that I was conducting a couple years ago. Uh, in Ghana, for instance, I was in a, in a rural community called Kome, uh, a very, very small, small community uh, with a, a junior high school, which was the most senior level of education uh, that they had as, as an infrastructure there in this community. And I, I talked to, to students and, and teachers and they all told me the benefits that they derived from 4-H or school-based agriculture education. But what I was really interested in was how is this impacting the community and how is this impacting farmers? So the, the, the teacher brought together a group of about 10 different farmers. We sat in the, in the faculty lounge of this, of this rural junior high school. There were three students in the back, uh, two young boys and a, and a young girl. And I, I, I asked the, 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 these farmers, uh, you know, what has been the impact of school-based agricultural education on you. And one farmer yells out 25 by 75, which is the, the spacing in centimeters uh, for, for, for maize. Another yelled out one seed per hole. Another yelled out fertilizer application. And I said, this is, this, is, this is wonderful. Like you all learned this from school-based agricultural education. Yes, yes, yes. The 4-H program taught us all these things. I said, so what's been the impact on, on your yields, on your, on your income? They all went around and told me that, that these innovations had improved their, their yields by about 100%, doubled, doubled their, their, their maize yields. I said, well, who taught you? And there was this lanky farmer that was sitting next to me, and he stands up and was very, very animated. He points to the back of the room and says, they did. They did it. The youth. The youth taught me. I said, which youth? He goes, Grace taught me. Another one says, Ishmael taught me. Another one said, well, of course she taught me. So I pulled Ishmael aside. After, uh, after this meeting, I said, Ishmael, these, these farmers are crediting you and, your, and your, your peers with increasing their yields by almost 100%. Like, how did you do this? And Ishmael was uh, 17 years old, and he said about two years ago, because I was walking through the community, and I overheard a group of farmers complaining about their, about their low yields. Uh, no matter where you are around the world, whether it's West Texas or West Africa, farmers are always complaining about their low yields. But he said, I heard them complain about their low yields, and I walked up to them and said, I can help you get higher yields. I said, but you were a kid, and these were, were grown adult men. How did they respond to you? He said, they hesitated, but they had seen the impact on the school demonstration farm and knew I had been educated, so they listened. And one of the farmers invited him to his farm, he taught him how to uh, create terraces, how to properly uh, apply composting and, and chemical fertilizer so that it wouldn't wash away into runoff and actually impact his farm. He said, I spent two hours with him and that was enough. And now this young man, Ishmael, uh, wants to become an agriculture extension officer. Well, you've given an example of the power of youth, right? Um, Absolutely. Not, not only as uh, what they absorb and, and how they can shape their future, but the things that are happening in the here and now with the communities that they're in. Um, just fantastic. Thank you, Trent. Um, I'd like to turn to our final panelist, uh, Ben Leka. And Ben, I'd like to go to you and get your perspective from the business side of things. You're the CEO of the African Agri Council joining us from South Africa. You're working with agribusiness um, across the continent 
building networks, creating demand, uh, and shaping the market so that African agricultural innovations and agribusiness can really thrive and make a widespread impact on how people farm, how they harvest, how, how they eat and how they thrive. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, how do young people factor into a vibrant Africa agribusiness landscape? And do they have the right tools to be part of innovation, growth and impact? Thank you, Nabia, and um, thank you to FAO and uh, everyone for joining us and uh, for inviting the African Agri Council. Uh, for start, uh, it's good to see so many uh, people sharing some of the concerns and identifying the opportunities that, uh, that we have. Uh, agriculture and the youth are two subjects that can easily be politicized. Uh, even though there seems to be quite a disconnect between policymakers, the private sector, as well as the youth. And that's where the council comes in, is to trying to bridge that gap in connecting private sector policymakers, investors, um, different stakeholders across uh, the value chain to be able to uh, truly impact agriculture on the African continent. And uh, it, it's important for every stakeholder to understand that the development of agriculture is a long-term process that requires a clear strategic focus. And uh, that was brought up in our um, opening keynote by Her Excellency. And at the start of the discussion, uh, every time I have the opportunity to speak or to speak to the youth, I always start by saying agriculture is a science and a business that requires an entrepreneurial approach plenty of risk capital and favorable policies. So there's a role that each party and each individual needs to play. Uh, I, was I was happy to hear about um, the work that NAPAD is doing with that Amadi uh, graciously shared, but a little bit concerned that out of 44 countries on the continent, only 14 were able to uh, give an update in terms of the work that they're doing to involve the youth in agriculture. Um, and Unfortunately, we need to see more of those, uh, those examples across the continent. And uh, as long as there's still that bit of disconnect between the different parties, then it's difficult to start planning on how to involve the youth into the sector. So we need to continue thinking about agriculture as uh, requiring that entrepreneurial approach, requiring the, the necessary capital and requiring the favorable uh, policies. And unfortunately, the youth doesn't always see it that way. Uh, working on the ground, uh, when the council started connecting business opportunities to investors, the first two months when we made that official announcement that the council was going to facilitate that, uh, that engagement with the financial community, we received over $2 billion worth of projects in our database in less than two months. Uh, however, once we started going through those projects and doing our due diligence, we could see that there was, again, there's a lack of understanding in terms of what, what are the necessary criteria that investors will be looking for or when, the, when, the, uh, when they're seeking for investment opportunity. But also from an investment perspective, their criteria are not necessarily in the context of Africa or in the context of an African youth, because the majority of those projects, 60% and above, were, were presented to us by young people who might have inherited land, who have project of feeding the community, they saw the opportunity there, and they want to be able to tap into uh, those opportunities. Unfortunately, their understanding of what is required to uh, secure funding for them to be able to start impacting the community there's a bit of a gap there and as i said a gap from the financial community as well so that becomes the first challenge for us and for incorporating the youth into the transformation of agriculture uh, secondly when you start again engaging with the youth you quickly see that agriculture is the afterthought, as the Excellency said herself. It's very difficult to see young men 
actually uh, looking at agriculture and seeing himself as a business owner or seeing himself driving a beautiful car or seeing himself with in a beautiful home it's very difficult because what they can see and what they can relate to is hard labor subsistence sector so that impacts how they see agriculture and that's the danger for us as as, as a community it's a danger for us as, as as the continent because when you start looking at the average age of a african producer or a farmer you will quickly see that it's mostly the older generation and the integration of the younger generation is taking place at a very slow pace so we need to change that narrative and we need to think to change that perspective as soon as possible and those are principles that can be taught at a school level but as an industry as industry stakeholders we also need to understand what is required from our side to make sure that the youth can truly impact the, uh, the industry we are as the council working with different partners we started to look at, 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 at different programs that will combine technical and operational support for young entrepreneurs in, uh, in agriculture. And I was at a recent meeting with government uh, officials and we brought up the question, yes, we will assess some of the businesses uh, that come our way. We will work with the youth to make sure that the business are operational and eventually bankable. But what happens when we identify the gap and us as the council, we, don't, we uh, do not necessarily have the funding to address that gap. We know that young business owner or that young entrepreneur doesn't have the funding to address that gap. Is there, do we have access to funding that can address those gaps, helping those businesses to be a bit more sustainable? And we all started looking at each other without an answer because the funding is not there. And if we had to speak to the investment community, there's not necessarily a, a tailor-made African youth funding that is there to support these businesses. And if they are, the bureaucracy and the process is just very discouraging for some of these young entrepreneurs. And uh, through our own uh, ESP and FT initiative, we believe that we can start working with the youth uh, a bit more closely, uh, bringing in the different stakeholders, whether it's public or private uh, 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 sector, to, to almost switch the that that innovative uh mindset that is within the youth to change that narrative and to get them involved into uh into agriculture yeah it's it's um this need for creating a, a synergistic ecosystem where so many things need to work right for us to really reap the benefits of agricultural transformation and and you and others um have talked about reaching uh, young people and youth early on, as early on as possible, um, with Trent's example as well on how they can be influencers in the here and now, um, and reaching them at schools, in spaces where they already are. Uh, it's not only an obvious place to start, but it seems from your perspective also a smart place to start. Uh, but it seems that there is um, a need to align what youth are exposed to early on and their agricultural experience early on with um, what are the business imperatives and the business needs uh, and, and how do we align the two if you could talk about that well the wealthiest farmers that i've met were all exposed to agriculture at a young age uh, that's a fact uh, it's not something that you wish to do when you retire it's not something that you wish to do when you have a bit of time and uh, agriculture, unfortunately, is the only sector where we tend to think about it from, from a retirement perspective. Um, I will never think when it's time for me to retire to be a doctor or to be a, an engineer. Unfortunately for agriculture, that's the case. And in many places on the continent, that's how people think about it. So I'm a firm advocate of reforming the African education system and curriculum. Um, it's a clear pathway for me to developing future leaders and entrepreneurs in this continent. We need to invest in the knowledge and skills that is needed for economic development and building 
credible and resilient institutions on the continent. That's the only way that we will develop this continent. And starting at a school level, it's the obvious place to change the narrative of how agriculture is perceived by many. Uh, we cannot, you will not attract the youth if they still link agriculture to poverty. It's very difficult to do that. And sometimes you almost force to invite them to very uh, big farming conferences or uh, trade shows where they can actually see farmers spend millions of dollars on equipment, where they can actually see that farming is not limited to primary agriculture or from a production perspective, as was shared by, um, by the speak by previous uh, panelists, but there's an entire value chain that they can, talk, that can, that, that they can work in, an, an entire value chain that's made of different subsectors where they can contribute and where they can create wealth. So to start at, an at, at, at a school level, helps us change that narrative uh, in terms of their perception, but also incorporate that business mentality into the agricultural, um, into the agricultural training. So it's, we, as, as I said, it's a time, so you need to know how to farm. You need to understand the, the sector and the industry, but it's also a business. That means you need to understand the business fundamentals for you to become a success, for you to run a multinational business that just produces food for people, that provide uh, service across the value chain, that's in logistics or technology or whatever the case may be. And you see a lot of, and, and I've seen a lot of experts uh, really focusing on the digital aspect of agriculture and only looking at that as the key, the focal point of attracting the youth. We need to look at the entire value chain and there's a role that our education system needs to play in facilitating that bridge. Thank you, Ben. Um, so much, uh, so much there, so much opportunity and so much need. And, and I know we'll get it right. Um, we have no choice. We've, we've got some wonderful questions from the floor. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for all of them, uh, but we'll lift up a few. Uh, the first, um, perhaps uh, Trent and, and Ben, you could comment on this as well. Um, but Trent, starting with you, uh, educators are vital in guiding youth in their learning and integration into the agricultural system. How can we develop the capacity of educators to be prepared to develop the knowledge and the skills of youth? Yeah, thank you, Nabi. I, I think there are really two, two ways because you have two different sets of teachers in a way. First, you had the teachers who are already in the field. Uh, and so we must roll out a set of professional development in-service teacher training seminars uh, that focus both on pedagogy, how to teach experientially uh, agriculture, uh, but also focus on these improved agricultural innovations. Uh, and so, so I think the first piece is focusing on teachers who are already in the field, and we do that through, through in-service teacher trainings and targeting them. And then second is about future teachers and preparing uh, future teachers and improving uh, higher education, teacher training, training colleges uh, to be able to prepare uh, agriculture and, and integrated science teachers to use the school-based agricultural education model, to use this experiential learning pedagogy to better teach agriculture in uh, junior high, senior high school uh, settings. Excellent. Uh, Fatian and Ben, would you, uh, each of you like to weigh in? Perhaps we can go to you, Fatian, first um, on this question. You are on mute. Sorry, uh, sorry, Nebraska. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, we have to improve the image of agriculture because agriculture is not considered as a profitable business uh, because there is no capital, especially for users who are uh, in a very less productive environment, a marginal environment. There is no capital for them. And most of the innovations, agricultural innovations, are designed for high input or ecologically rich environments. 
then you have to reach at least at the middle level to encourage the, the youth group. In, in the area where I'm working, uh, the government, local government was working very hard to transform the mountainous areas and reforestation. We have been really globally awarded for that. But now there is no focus and there is no uh, investment. There is no also targeting those uh, 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 youth groups to be engaged on that. So that's why I said, you know, we have really to design uh, 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 multiple entry points and heterogeneous entry points and also targeting sensitive environment. Sensitive environment in a war zone area, a climatically affected area, less advantageous groups, you know. Totally, those youth groups, they have no future on their mind. I like the, the court. We cannot do anything without having them. So I'm looking forward for, uh, uh, I mean, paradigm shift. I mean, redefining the youth engagement uh, uh, and building the image of agriculture as a profitable business. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Fetian. Uh, ben, could you comment? Uh, I know you had some of these points in your remarks, but building that capacity of educators to prepare mm -hmm. uh, the skills of young people, develop that knowledge, and perhaps in alignment with what the business needs are. Mm, absolutely. The, the scientific and academic approach is absolutely on point, as, as Trent uh, mentioned and uh, Dr. Fetian mentioned. Uh, what I will add to that is the mentorship aspect of uh, agriculture, uh, which helps almost on a technical and operational day-to-day -day, uh, for young entrepreneurs. Uh, and that can be looked at at a high school level or at a college level, uh, which, whichever uh, you choose. However, the mentorship uh, prospect is very important and that's something that we've added to the FT initiative where we know there's a the majority of startups and businesses they tend to fail in the first year unless they have the right supports and mentorship to help them through that difficult journey we went through that ourselves we were fortunate enough to have people to support us through that journey uh, secondly is to bring people who are actually have done have run the business of agriculture and you bring those successful uh, entrepreneurs or businesses to showcase to the young people and young future entrepreneurs that you can actually be a success in this in this um, uh, in this field not just to talk to them but almost create a, a, a project or a plan that will support those businesses where they can have first and advice and support from someone who's run the business, might be retired or is still working, but still is committed to uh, seeing young entrepreneurs coming up, still committed to seeing Africa move forward, have those kind of uh, figures to be involved into the discussion. You bringing the private sector on board, you bringing someone who's very successful, who will help change the narrative and the picture of what agriculture is. Once you can add that to the academic and scientific um, uh, approach, then you almost have that perfect picture. I think the only uh, point that we'll be missing is that policy element, where we know now that we're seeing across the continent, there's a bit of a, an awareness or an empowerment movement that's coming up with the youth starting to think about politics and how that impacts their life. That will only come once they start seeing that, look, for me to be successful, for me to run a successful business on the continent, I need favorable policies. And I have the power to impact those policies. Let's combine that and we will see positive results. Great. Our, our second question, uh, I'm going to direct this one to Hamadi and also to Sherry from, from the perspective of Hamadi, looking at it from the supply side and, and Sherry, perhaps from your perspective on what are the needs um, in order for, for, uh, for you to be successful. Uh, in agriculture. And so the question is, how do we ensure that youth get access to the required resources to perform agriculture, um, given the fact that youth are less likely to access capital, they're less likely to be in a position to access innovations that are aimed at high productive areas, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, so uh, perhaps Sherry, you could you could speak first about what is needed. What do young people not have access to? And then Hamadi jump in with um, what is the policy imperative and and what's happening across the continent to improve the situation. Oh, actually, no, it was like a common topic mentioned that uh, access to finance is actually the problem in, in the youth sector. So if they actually have a great idea, but they don't have, you know, uh, finance and uh, financial support to that, it will not happen. But more than that, a lot of young people, they don't have experience. So there must be like a role model example of a successful agribusiness who could mentor them and show them the way so that if this youth will you know, uh, there, there's a management of, of risk, right, on the capital also supported to them. Like, for example, me, I started my company when I was 20. So I was 20 years old. I'm already running an agribusiness company. And it's not easy. Agriculture is not for the faint heart. It's so difficult to get investments because it's risky. I live in a country where war is happening in the south of Philippines every year. Uh, we have 20 to 21 typhoons every year and market is so um, political, politically driven, you know. But I think first is for the youth to have that kind of grit and tenacity that if they want to go into agriculture, money will not make sense if the values and attitude of the youth is actually not geared toward building it into agribusiness. And second one, um, you know, changing the narrative of agriculture, right? Because agriculture is always associated to poverty and drudgery. I'm known to this, Nabiha, of making farming sexy. You know, glamorizing farming. When people would see dirt in soil, I see gold. Because I'll never dedicate 22 years of my life building business in agriculture and running businesses, not only in the Philippines, you know, uh, I, I do an impact fund uh, based in Singapore and we're in actually investing in different countries in Southeast Asia. And common problem I encounter, a lot of young people, they have good idea, but they don't have mentor, they don't have uh, money. If they have the mentor and the money, they don't know how to access market because market sometimes is also controlled by big institutional market. So you need to really know how to play the game in agribusiness. And the third one, I guess, is more educational component and the youth in agriculture. I like actually the comment of Trent. <coughs> uh, my company started the first farm school in the Philippines that is actually accredited by the government. So now my farm school is running programs for the youth. We have uh, having three farm schools now in different areas in the Philippines. And these farm schools are actually working hand in hand with the government. So the government is funding our farm school. And I'm so happy to say that since we started the farm school, more than 50% of our enrollees are young people who were told by their parents who were farmers, please don't go into agriculture, study hard and leave the farm because this should not be your future. And here we are, our farm school is encouraging a lot of these young people to stay in the farm and take over the, their parents' land and make it more profitable. You know, and another one, of course, uh, a lot of young people are interested in research and development. They like new innovation because, uh, like for example, a new innovation in agriculture, mechanization, the dig digitizing agriculture is something that actually makes the youth uh, have greater access to the agriculture sector, makes the youth to actually help change the narrative in agriculture. So all of this I'm trying to incorporate in my company on how you know we can bring a lot of millennial even to be uh, employed in the agriculture sector, but more than that, start their own you know enterprises so that they can give you know livelihood and sustainable opportunities in the rural areas. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Hamadi, would you like to weigh in from uh, from the uh, supply side of things, what do we need to make sure that our young people have access to? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Nabia. I think uh, on my end, um, I will just uh, use uh, two illustrations uh, on how uh, this can be done. Um, I have seen some questions uh, through the the chat function on uh, how to bring youth into. Uh, into agriculture, what are the perception of youth on agriculture, 
uh, why in some countries, I, I think there is someone from Ghana who said there is a disconnect uh, between the policies and uh, uh, and the youth uh, implication in uh, in different uh, platform and, and and how they can access to to different inputs and the like. So I just give like a two examples. The first one is a process uh, will be on the process, and the second one will be on on actions. So from the process point of view, uh, in the implementation of the uh, CADEP, which is the Malabo uh, commitment that I we mentioned earlier on. Um, the way it operated that at the beginning, uh, the African Union support countries develop strategies that are aligned to the continental frameworks. Uh, but the process is very, very inclusive. Uh, then once the strategy is developed, it is translated into what we call uh, a national agriculture investment plan. I'm sure if you Google it, you will see what we call NIPES. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we have about 47 countries out of the 55 African Union member states that have uh, gone through the process and have endorsed basically the CADEP process and have developed basically strategies that are CADEP uh, compliant. So now, uh, once you develop the National Agricultural Investment Plan, because it's done through a very pro uh, consultative process, the document is co-signed uh, I'll just give you one example, for example, of Cameroon, for example. I just, I'm just picking up what uh, off, off, off the top of our head. It was signed by the Prime Minister, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Land, uh, I think the Minister of Finance, uh, the head of the development partners who are operating in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Cameroon, the farmers' organizations, the youth organization, and the women organization, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, on the top of that, also it was also signed by the African Union. So it gave you a clearance that the document has gone through like a very rigorous uh, and, and uh, consultative process. And then through that process, uh, countries goes now and, uh, and mobilize resources. So now, the challenge we have now, uh, and I some, someone just uh, sent a question on the 10% budget uh, of CADEP. The challenge we have is that when we, uh, we, uh, we, we basically developed that framework about 15 years ago. Uh, we set for Agri uh, Africa to, to meet its need for food security. They need to, to grow basically uh, their productivity by 6% per annum. But for that to happen, they need to allocate about 10% of their uh, GDP to agriculture. Uh, unfortunately, this has not happened. Uh, to me, there were like a, um, one shortcoming is to consider that the only uh, investor in agriculture should be the government. Agriculture is a private initiative and it should be private sector driven. And that's the reason why uh, in the Malabo, uh, in the Malabo um, iteration, uh, a big emphasis has been put on uh, private sector engagement. Uh, so this led me to the second point that I wanted to, to make in terms of illustration. For example, at uh, the African Union AUD in Nepal, we have uh, this initiative that we call Grow Africa. So what we do usually is that we go into a country, it's a demand driven, so we come into a country uh, and then we help uh, the country to assess a value chain, for example, for uh, commodities that they deem as a priority. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, we're working on rice. Uh, in um, in uh, Burkina Faso, I think we're working on ma mangoes. Uh, in uh, Kenya, we're working on the horticulture sector. So we basically bring all the actors along the value chain. We identify where the problems are, uh, whether it's a youth engagement, whether it's a processing issue, whether it's a uh, it's an input issue uh, and the like. And then we help basically the different actors along the value chain to develop business cases. Once those business cases are developed now, uh, and this is the issue like uh, in terms of accessing to finance, once the business cases are developed now, we take those business cases and we use our name and leverage to bring private sector uh, to come to invest in it. Uh, we have already uh, made a matchmaking between private sector uh, and, 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 and different cases in uh, I think 12 countries uh, in the tone of more than $200 million uh, over the last three, three years. 
So basically, that's how we're addressing those issues. I don't know whether it has addressed, I mean, if I have responded to your question. Uh, yes, you have. Does anyone uh, else want to weigh in on, uh, on this question of, of meeting the needs of youth um, from your diverse perspectives and experiences on the front lines? I would just add one thing, yeah. Nabiha, uh, that, I, that I've mentioned several times in the comments. Uh, but there's a lot of talk about making, you know, agriculture sexy for youth and attracting youth to agriculture. What I've found in both Ghana and Liberia is that young people in these rural communities are already interested in agriculture. Uh, rather, it's outside forces who are shaming them about being in agriculture. So rather than, than thinking about how do we attract them to agriculture, it's rather about giving them permission to be in agriculture because it's something that they already want to be just like their parents. They just don't want to use the same methods that their parents use. They need, they need improved methods, improved innovations so they can make more money, but they already have a, a predisposition to want to be in agriculture mm -hmm. if we give them permission and the skills to do so. Well, well, can I speak? Yeah, Leviska? Yes, uh, go, yeah. go right ahead. Yeah, I would like also, you know, uh, there are a lot of opportunities in Africa uh, considering use, you know. Um, I'm from the farming community, my mother is a farmer, and I have also family farm. Uh, I feel like I have a time-tested knowledge in agriculture, but the labor is a constraining factor for me. And without the use, I cannot succeed. So the labor is the most important factor as a success factor. So what we are talking now is, you know, Africa is a very diverse uh, continent with full of opportunity, full of uh, health uh, contribution because of the diverse ecology we have, the diverse knowledge we have, the diverse food systems we have, and the technologies and the skills at the local level will be a source of inspiration for the scientists and also the business group. So we have really to cater the issue of youth group. And we, as a learning institute, we need to be also recognize our contribution. We have committed to agricultural cadres, ready to implement the new, I mean, the new shift that we need to uh, revise our curriculum. Because, you know, in most of African countries, including my country, uh, it, it's more academic. So vocationalizing education, is a mo uh, most important step. Establishing st uh, advisory group uh, for mentoring youth group is also uh, very important. I'm looking forward for such kind of innovative ideas uh, and showing success stories is already in our hand. But what we need is we need to work together for addressing and uh, stabilizing Africa and the workforce has to be stabilized also. So the social responsibility of all uh, decision makers, uh, scientists, experts, and also, you know, we are at, uh, we have a contribution as a leaders, but the social stability, social fabric is very important for uh, stable business and uh, entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you put it so well. Africa is full of opportunity and yeah. the local skills and passion are a source of inspiration and each of you have certainly inspired so many of us today. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Her Excellency President Banda, my colleagues at FAO, the Alliance to End Hunger, and at Humanitas who worked so hard to put this together. Um, there is such rich, rich insight shared today and I'm, I'm really inspired and encouraged because we have the tools, systems, and vision to enable youth-led ag transformation in Africa and around the world. The key is how we align policy design programs and make the wisest of investments to propel this urgent work forward. It's been a, a pleasure to participate and moderate this conversation today. And I'd like to hand it over to Director Sharon for his closing remarks. Director Sharon, you're on mute. Unmuted. Thank you, Nabia, and thank you, uh, all the panelists, uh, for your uh, absolutely fantastic uh, remarks. Uh, this was indeed an amazing area of thoughts, and uh, 
what comes out very clearly for me is that uh, there is no silver bullet and there is no magic wand. It's a, a rough and tough uh, journey ahead, but we all need to uh, pull together all our resources to ensure that this important aspect of integrating youth uh, in agriculture, of bringing the power, the enthusiasm, and the energy into agriculture is, is absolutely essential if we want to move on the journey uh, of uh, ensuring global food and nutrition for everyone. Uh, just a couple of uh, things. I, I don't think I'll, I'll uh, try and really uh, capture everything which everyone said because the uh, chat box is full of comments and I'm sure the audience is really participants have really taken to the, the views being expressed because I can see uh, nearly a parallel webinar going on in the chat box. And that's really, really, really encouraging. So uh, I, I'll only say that a couple of things really stood out, you know, youth for youth, and there's nothing about them without them. I think uh, Her Excellency made a fantastic opening statement with that, that you cannot work on youth ideas without really integrating and involving them in the decision-making process. And that really set the tone for the discussion today. Uh, youth as solutions, and we heard the need for exposure, training, giving them a voice, embracing their power, uh, uh, you know, understanding that they are the ones who need to come into the main uh, uh, decision-making positions to take this forward. The need to put on a gender lens, I thought, uh, again, an uh, extremely powerful opening statement by Her Excellency uh, when she says that the uh, woman tills, plants, harvests, and cooks first, but eats last and least. I, I thought uh, anyone working on gender and uh, looking at anything through a gender lens has to take this on. It's, it's a, such a powerful uh, picture which she has painted about where women stand, not just in Africa, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, though she was speaking from her experience there, I think it's a picture which can be true for any part of the world, especially the developing world. Uh, it's important to understand, uh, I think the need for de-risking agriculture. Uh, we heard the model for bringing the three M's, the money, the mentor, and the market. And, and, and that, those are really, really important, the need for changing curriculum, the need for changing the approach, the need for skill training, the need for entrepreneurial training. Uh, there were thousands of ideas which came through. So I, I thank you everyone for really flagging this. And uh, on our part, on FAO's part, uh, we have been pretty active in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, on our work in youth and agriculture transformation. We have currently over, I think over 20 dedicated projects going on uh, in Africa, many of them through partner organizations. Uh, we are partnering with uh, UNIDO on opportunities for youth in Africa, and uh, there are uh, programs running there on rural youth employment, green jobs and agripreneurship, skill development, farmer school. Uh, the programmatic focus, of course, is on knowledge generation, which is our uh, bread and butter. FAO is the knowledge organization. Uh, knowledge generation and tool and training packages. Like there's an excellent program going on in Uganda on the, uh, the junior farmer field and life uh, schools in Uganda. Uh, I'll invite all of you to really Google that and see it on the FAO website. Or maybe our communication team can put post the link on the, on, on the, in the chat box for this. We heard about the importance of integrating uh, uh, agriculture education in the school curriculum. And uh, uh, we are convinced that uh, at FAO that uh, uh, young people's interest in agriculture and food uh, goes a long way in, in improving school uh, attendance uh, by making that by making education more relevant to local lifestyle. And uh, we have lesser number of dropouts. We have decreased child labor if proper education is provided on agriculture issues in school. So um, I'm sure you all share uh, this belief that inclusive transformation of rural economies and agri-food systems cannot come about unless you have uh, the youth fully engaged in it. And uh, I, need, I think we need to really empower them in their role to achieve a sustainable and uh, equitable world. Uh, if anything, COVID-19 has really shown us how inequitable our growth patterns are. 
how inequitable our economies are, and how youth and women are really uh, intermarginalized in the group which really needs to be looked into and supported and brought into the mainstream. I think our discussions today in its own small way will help take these messages to policymakers around the world and uh, help them, help the youth, and ensure that we you know, usher in perhaps a youth revolution uh, for a sustainable and uh, remunerative agriculture. So uh, thank you all of you for joining and thank you to all the participants uh, who tuned in from various parts of the world. It has definitely been one of the most uh, engaging group of participants, I must say. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I nearly felt that there was a parallel webinar going on in the chat box. So thank you very much, all of you. And uh, back to you, Nabiha, and thank you, Nabiha, uh, for a fantastic moderation uh, uh, and uh, for posing some uh, difficult and probing questions to our eminent panelists. And, and that really brought out the essence of their talk and their ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you to Alliance for co-hosting this with us, to Humanities, your organization for co-hosting this with us. Thank you all of you. Nabiya. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording uh, tomorrow and appreciate everyone's insights and of course for hosting. Have a great rest of the day and evening. Um, and good health to all. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.